we're going to start in just a minute or two. I think there are one or two people in the back. Just to, you can hear this all the way through, so I'll see, uh, let them have a little bit of time to get here. Just maybe, maybe two minutes, okay? Get here last, you gotta sit up front, right? It's reserved for that, yeah. Good to see you all, and um, thanks for worshiping this morning. It was 1996. So we didn't have one every year, but I went back and checked. As I said this morning, it's the 21st that I know of on the records that we have, and just a wonderful contribution to Highland. And last year, we were going to have Julia with us as we were starting the story, which is a year-long Bible study, which we postponed for a year. So we'll start it this year. And um, of different people down there, when you go to the other school, don't even mention some of those other schools by name, you'll usually get a phone call that night when someone beat your team. And uh, they'll, they'll rub it in. But I looked through her uh, two-page uh, resume, and it's just amazing what uh, the articles and the books and the courses and the specialities and the, um, just fascinating, Julian, what you've done, and to try to sh put all of that in a sermon and a lecture. We really appreciate your effort and appreciate you being here. I want to appreciate uh, Sarah and Alicia representing the Royer family. Let's give them a big hand for allowing this to happen. Thank you. Thank you. And Julia, thank you very much. And we will open it up to you and uh, provide us with some thoughts. And then if you would take some uh, question and answer time. And then um, I'll be glad to close. Or uh, Noe, did I see you? Would you close in a short prayer when she's finished? And we'll, okay. Short prayer, so we can have a proper lunch. But thank you for Linda Brackbill and, and Rick for providing some energy in between. Thank you. There's Linda. Thank you. Big hand for Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Julia, thank you very much. Some of you came back. I, I didn't chase you away too easily, and some of you are joining us for the first time, or at least the first time today, and I just want to share also my uh, appreciation for the Carson Lectures. They're, they're really important, and I feel very honored to have been invited to be part of this series. Um, Perhaps those of you who are here this morning can kind of tell my, my mind works in unusual ways. <laughs> and one of the things that I get fascinated by is what I call common knowledge. You know what I'm talking about? There are things that people know that aren't really true. Like, have you not heard this one? That if you drop food on the floor, and eat it within five seconds that you won't get sick. Everybody knows this, right? Uh, there's, there's also all kinds of <clears throat> common knowledge about the Bible, too, you know, that, for example, that the fruit in the Garden of Eden was an apple. This is not true, but everybody knows that, right? So common knowledge is what I'm calling that this kind of commonly held but false information that's out there. And there's a lot of it that goes around with the Bible. Um, it's not really true that the name that Jesus called God, Abba, was baby talk for father. Right? There's, there's just a lot of stuff that's out there, and I get fascinated how people got to know things, right, that may not necessarily have been true. 
But there's another kind of common knowledge where something's not really false, but it's only one way of thinking, right? So, you know, that there might be multiple legitimate ways of looking at things that people know. And, and when I do this, I mean, like, no. They just know that one thing is particularly the case, and you cannot talk them out of it. Right? So there are many Christians that know that biblical stories were written down after they had been passed down orally. We, we don't really know that, but it would be hard to talk a lot of people out of that. Right? A lot of Christians know that Jesus was nicer to women than the Jews of his own day. We don't really know that. That's, that's only one way of interpreting the text and the data that we have, but people know it, and they'll, they'll fight you tooth and nail about it. So do you get the idea that I'm talking about? That there, there are these common knowledge things that people are just convinced of, and I'm not even talking about politics right now. I'm just talking about the Bible, that people know things about the Bible that could be true, but aren't necessarily true. And I'm fascinated by this. Where did these ideas come from? Where did they come from? And how did they get passed down in such a way that people can just say it without even thinking that they need to defend it? Right? So, as you can probably tell from Dr. Raby's comments in my sermon this morning, my academic specialty is the prophets. Those books in the Bible, Isaiah, Jeremiah, the 12 little ones, the prophets, um, I study these a lot and have for a long time. And I've also studied prophets, prophetic movements in the New Testament. And within the last couple of years, I've been learning about prophetic movements over history, like in Judaism and Christianity, and I've been reading a lot about prophetic movements today, people today who are claiming to be prophets. So you might imagine, anytime I'm anywhere, even if I'm out to dinner, back when I used to do that, um, and if I hear the, the word prophet, prophetic, or prophecy, my ears perk up. So what I've, what I've heard with these highly tuned ears is that people have some very deeply held assumptions about what a prophet is, what a prophet does, and all kinds of things like how prophets get along with religious institutions. In fact, they are so embedded that you can't talk them out of it that I'm going to call that an orthodoxy you know, the correct way of thinking. So there are all these prophetic orthodoxies out there, but, as you might guess, not everybody's orthodoxy is the same. So what I've heard, what I've read, what I've found, is that some people are convinced that prophets predict the future. My PowerPoint's not behaving with me any very well. There's something underneath there, too, but you get my idea. That the that prophets predict the future, and I don't know if you know this, there are people that are closely related to former President Trump politically who are making lots of prophecies right now about what his future will be like, not only in 2024, but uh, up until that. So there's a lot of that. Oh, I thought he was coming for me. Um, anyway, so, so there's a lot of people today who are claiming to be able to predict our own future. So there are other orthodoxies, too. There are people who are convinced that prophets... Ha, huh, I did something wrong with my PowerPoint, Jonathan. It's not doing animations, but... Um, Got any advice? It's not doing animations. Well, there we go. 
So use your imagination, right? Um, so there are a lot of people who believe that prophets predicted Jesus, right? That is actually something in the past. And for a lot of folks, there are no prophets today because once the prophets have predicted Jesus, it's no longer, you don't need them anymore, and they're gone. Um, there are other people who have different views about prophets, and that is that they're more charismatics. Right, that, can, can you see the people's hands in the back? Right, that they're, they're, they're raised, that prophecy is a gift that you can receive, and I don't know if you know this, you can also get training about how to be a prophet. I, this is on Amazon. You can go learn how to be a prophet on Amazon. All the, all the ways that Amazon has blessed our lives. So if you're with me, there are all these different orthodoxies about prophets out there, that they predict the future, that they predict Jesus, that they're charismatics. But there's one that I really want to talk about today, and that is that prophets were socially active social critics. So you can see, kind of hear this orthodoxy even on the internet as well. Like if you Google Martin Luther King Jr., sometimes he'll be called a prophetic voice. He, he'll be called a prophet. You can find the words prophet, prophecy, prophetic, used on, not only on the internet in this way, but, um, oh, that is also related to this other idea that prophets do not predict the future, they don't foretell, but instead they foretell, that they, they tell the truth, they, they speak the truth, but they're, they're not predictors, they're something else. Um, if you've ever taken a religious studies class and had a biblical studies textbook, chances are that was in your textbook, that it told you that prophets are not foretellers, they're foretellers. So you can find this orthodoxy in textbooks. Um, I found it on the PCUSA website. Right? So I don't know if you can see it that way. You know, so when somebody like on this website is using, when they're saying raise a prophetic voice through the social justice possibility, uh, policy of the Presbyterians, they're not talking about predict the future. They're not talking about charismatics. They're talking about social justice. I'm a member of the United Church of Christ. It's all over our website too. We use the word prophetic to mean that. Um, I have found it even among people who don't call themselves religious. So I, I found this article several years ago that even in the Black Lives Matter movement, folks who are standing up for social justice, they're talking about the prophets as voices of social change. Now, here's, here's my point for a moment, that all of these orthodoxies about the prophets, that they predicted the future, that they predicted Jesus, that they're charismatics, and that they're social critics, all of them have some truth in them. So you can go to the Bible, and you can go to prophetic movements over time, and you can find evidence that would completely back them up. So it's not that they're not true, they're that kind of common knowledge. It's not that they're not true, but, right, and here's my big but, each of them is limited. They're, they're incomplete. They don't say everything that's true. And as I was talking about this morning, when we only look for one thing, we usually only see one thing. We, we tend to kind of bracket out what doesn't fit. And we don't always do it consciously. We do it unconsciously. And so this idea that we are all selective seers as well as readers is an idea I want to work on for a little bit. And to do that, I'm going to kind of 
leave the prophets for just a minute, and I'd like to talk about an artist, right? I don't know if you've ever encountered the work of the artist Titus Kaphar. If you haven't, I encourage you to go to the internet, but not right now. Right, put, that, put that phone away, right? Uh, go to the internet and, and look up some of Titus Kaphar's work, because it's just amazing. And you can also find on the internet, he did a 2017 TED Talk in which he talked about going to art school. So Titus Kaphar went to art school, and like anybody else going to art school, he learned how to paint, he learned all the techniques, and he also learned how to analyze art. This is one of the things that you do at art school. And so at art school, he began to learn all the things about art, including by this painting. This is a painting that was done by a Dutch painter in the 1600s. Um, his name is Franz Hals. And at school, Titus Kaphar learned everything about this painting, right? He learned, for example, why the artist, Franz Hals, come on. Well, why the artist, Franz Hals, why they have that lace, why they have the woman's necklace, why the characters are wearing that, those particular clothes, and what he learned is that everything in the painting was intended so that you would see this as a rich family. They had the right clothes, they had the right jewelry. You know, art, art people learn that if you put color in a particular place, your eyes go there. So in a better reproduction of this, you can see that the woman's wearing a gold necklace. So Titus Kaphar, he learned all of that but one of the things that fascinated him is that nobody, nobody, nobody that he was talking to said anything about the second figure from the right. Never mentioned. What about that figure? Who is he, she, they? Who, who, who is that? And Kafar learned that more has been written about that woman's lace than about what this other figure is doing in the painting. And so, artist that he was, Titus Kaphar, painted that picture himself. He made, he made a copy of it all by himself, because he, he knew all the techniques, so that it would be his to modify as he saw fit, he wasn't going to deface somebody else's painting. And what he did to get us to pay attention to the figure that nobody was paying attention to is he began to white out the things that you've been encouraged to see so that you would see the thing that nobody had encouraged you to see. He had to block our vision about what we were traditioned, that's a, that's a fancy word, isn't it? That the tradition had made us see so that we would see something, someone else. We, we had to be forced to see something that we didn't see. So I just, I love his work. He, he's done this with all kinds of art. And I find this a very helpful way of visualizing the kind of approach that I'm suggesting today about how we can see beyond our own orthodoxies. And in this case, for today's lecture, our own orthodoxies about the prophets. Because you have to know what you've been trained to see before you can start the work of seeing something else. You have to kind of recognize your own traditioning. So I, I told you my mind works in interesting ways. So I got fascinated about where did this orthodoxy that the prophets or social critics come from? 
So I've been doing all this kind of stuff. So I have been reading church history. I went into seminary archives, which you can now find on the internet. The internet has blessed us. Uh, seminary archives and went in and found lecture notes that students had taken about what professors said. Right, so I, I learned how clergy were being educated at different times. I found on the internet, I found old magazines. I found radio addresses. I found denominational speeches. Because what I was trying to do is I was trying to trace this genealogy, like where did that come from? And where did, how did it get so popular? How, how do things get popular? What I found out, and you probably would say, oh, well, of course you found this out. It makes sense that we learn things not just from books, but from other people, right? We learn things from our teachers. We learn them from our pastors. We learn them from our friends. So yes, books are important. I'm a big believer in books. And yet, these interconnections right, between people is actually how ideas get popularized. It even gets popularized through people that we encounter on media, right? So I know we don't think of technology as being real people, but sure, there's, there's people behind it. And so if you'll indulge me, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you some highlights of where I think this conviction, this orthodoxy about prophets being social activists come from. And so to do that, I'm going to have to be a child of the 1960s and do like they did on the TV sitcoms when they wanted you to go back in time. Excuse me. And we're going to go back in time, and we're going to go to Germany. That's, that's Germany. And we're going to Germany in it's the 1800s, and we're at a university that I'm going to call Göttingen, because that's the name of the city, and the name of the university is really loud. It's really long. So our story, I'm going to start the story here. Göttingen University was established to be an enlightenment university. Now, so maybe you haven't been in school for a while, but most of us learned at some point about what the enlightenment was. This was a period of intellectual history where thinkers said that you should leave behind superstition and tradition and really appeal to logic and reason. Age of reason. Sound familiar? Uh, and scholars all over the world were doing this, we know about this one, in the natural sciences. You know, they were trying to figure out what are the laws of the universe? Gravity, Right, motion, how do things work? Like, how does nature work? But what you might or may not, you may or may not know, is that people were also doing that in theology departments. At Göttingen and other universities, biblical scholars were studying the Bible the same way that natural scientists were studying gravity and all of that. That is, they were applying reason and logic. And they were really looking for what are the reasonable explanations for things that the Bible will call miracles or the supernatural. You with me so far? So, aren't you having fun in Germany? We're in Germany um, this morning there. So, now at Göttingen, there were a whole series of teachers who taught students, who then joined the faculty, talk about a chain, right, that really got interested in how the Bible was really written. Now, when I said really, they meant really. Not the way the Bible says it got written, but the way it really got written. And one of these guys 
This guy over here on the right, his name is Julius Bellhausen. He's kind of infamous in some circles. Who had been a student of that guy, Eichhorn, and somebody who's hiding behind uh, Martin Luther there? We'll come back to him in a minute. Um, what Julius Fellhausen did is he applied reason and logic and said, you know, I think the way the Bible presents the way things happened was not the way it really happened. And particularly, what Fellhausen said is that the prophets, you wondered when I would get back to them, the prophets, Amos, Isaiah, actually were one of the earliest parts of ancient Israel's faith. Now, if, if you know your Bible, you may be thinking, wait a minute, they're not first. Moses came first. The, the law of Moses came first. And to you, uh, Wilhelm would say, yes, the Bible says that, but that's not what really happened. What he said is that the prophets came first. They taught ethics. They told you how to act, how to be, how to do all of that. And then only later... After the Babylonian exile, when the people were coming back, did a group of priests that, here, these are Wellhausen's quotes. You're going to like it. Right? Uh, he called them senile, unimaginative, dogmatic, rude, crude, mechanical, if not cancerous, and parasitic. Can you tell he did not like them? Right? So according to him, those really bad priests, they actually came up with all those laws and rituals and sacrifices, and then they presented it as if Moses had said it, and they did that so that it would have more authority. This really got a lot of people upset, a lot, because it was going against the way the Bible presents itself, but what Wilhelmsen and his teachers and the, his students said is, look, don't blame us. This is the science. Like, if you, if you follow logic and reason, I could show you how they did that if you ever cared. Right, how they, how they did that, it, it's, it's actually scientific. Like, it's science. But, you can tell I kind of set you up for this, but we can tell from a distance that, well, of course... They were influenced by their own belief systems and their culture. And that's why I have a picture of Martin Luther up there. One of the interesting things about all of those scholars, German scholars from Göttingen, is they said they were not bound to the church. Right? They were against tradition and they were just scientists. But every single one of them was strongly influenced by the Lutheran tradition. Now, I don't know how you're doing with your theology training these days, but Luther was a big believer that law is bad and that that was something Jesus came to save us from by giving us grace. That's, that's a big thing in Lutheranism between law and grace. Of course a Lutheran <laughs> is going to be at least influenced to see the prophets as good because they taught ethics and to see the law is bad because those are rules and obligations. So the first part of my story is that step one is these, Lu these German scholars influenced by Lutheran theology really claimed that the prophets come first, not just in importance, but also in time, that the prophets are the thing. And what Wilhelmsen said is that the prophets were good, the law that those priests did tried to choke it out, and that law only got thrown off again when Jesus, the new prophet, came. This, this was the role that these German scholars had in getting us to where we're going to get. So far, so good? Don't you feel very German? Some of you probably speak German much better than I do. So to, to do the next part of the story, though, we have to jump the pond. We, we have to leave 
Germany, and come to the United States. Okay. So by 1900, ooh, look how close we're getting to our own time period. By 19, my, my grandparents were born in the late 1890s. So, I mean, this is getting really close to my personal family history. So by 1900, German scholarship was the cutting edge science of the day. So people who, uh, all over the world, scholars from all over the world, they not only read Wellhausen's books, but they actually went by boat. Like they, they traveled back and forth to Germany in order to study with him and his teachers and his students. Um, and then when they got back home, they became teachers at theological schools, right? And that German cutting edge science that we'll just associate with Fellhausen became part of the curriculum. And again, remember said I got into these seminary archives? I have copies of students writing down notes about Wellhausen, right, around this time period. Um, and it became the curriculum at places like, let's call us out, Lancaster Theological Seminary, which got started out as a seminary of the Reformed Church before the Reformed Church merged to become the United Church of Christ. And, okay, Presbyterians, you're really important to the story, um, Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Um, so at Union, right, this became the curriculum. Right? I, I, along with people who were doing the same thing in New Testament too, but that's a story for another day. Um, and at this, at Union, there was another network of teachers who taught students, who graduated and joined the faculty. And one of those hiding in the background is a guy named Charles Briggs. So when Charles Briggs came to Union, he gave a big address, and he claimed that the prophets did not predict the future. And guess what? The Presbyterian Church put him on trial for heresy. Right? Um, he he got at that isn't all he said, but he got he got he kind of got out of that. But he taught a guy named Francis Brown, who's you get half of his ear back there. And Francis Brown taught a guy named Harry Emerson Fosdick. Harry Emerson Fosdick is the most famous face of a movement in the early 20th century called the Social Gospel Movement. So again, this was early 20th century in the United States. And this movement was just insistent that to be a faithful Christian meant that you had to feed the poor, you had to address poverty, particularly labor conditions. Child labor was a big concern of the social gospel movement. Uh, they did war uh, and other kinds of social ills. And it claimed that Christianity was at its core committed to the social gospel. And guess what? To prove that they were right, they used scientific German biblical scholarship. They said, see, look, I can prove it to you. Prophets came first. Prophets were teachers of ethics, and they came first, and rituals and traditions and laws are bad. So it, it, it took that from those German scholars, but even though they claimed to be repeating what the German biblical scholars had said, Guess what, Presbyterians? All these people, not just at Union, but the other people in the social gospel, they were almost all Calvinists. That is, they all came from traditions that had been influenced by John Calvin. This was true. Lancaster Seminary was part of the Reformed Church. Harry Emerson Fosdick was Baptist, even though he studied at Union. So, you know, Calvin influenced a lot of different religious tra traditions, 
And as you probably know, Calvin really believed that Christians could make the world a better place. You may have learned about how he tried to create Geneva into a place that was going to be far more uh, just than it had been before. So Calvinists really are fairly optimistic that the world could be a better place, but Lutherans aren't. Now, wouldn't you know it, just at the time that, again, we're in the early 1900s at Union Theological Seminary with all these Calvinists, they're doing this at a time that there was another movement coming through the United States. Elsewhere, too, but we'll just focus on ourselves for a minute. It's called modernism. So early 20th century, you, you get a lot of architecture and books and things saying, we're going to be modern. And what they were really believing is that science and progress could make this world a better place. So maybe you can see how all this comes together, right? So German scientific biblical scholarship uh, gets taken up by Calvinists who believe that the world can be a better place at a time when modernism is saying science is good. And they said, hey, we got science. We got scientific German scholarship here. Now, okay, how did that get so popular, though? Harry Emerson Fosdick was a rock star before there was rock and roll. That, this was one of the fun parts of my research. So he preached before huge crowds at Riverside Church in New York City. And he wrote prolifically not only books about biblical interpretation that had the word modern in them, the modern use of the Bible, the modern blank, the modern this, but... You know, I'm a little jealous, maybe you can tell. He wrote for the Atlantic Monthly, Christian Century, Good Housekeeping, Ladies Home Journal. And he published over 60 times in the Reader's Digest. He had a weekly radio program that was heard all over the world, and you can see it up here. He was on the cover of Time Magazine in 1930. So I celebrate the wealth of experience we have in the room. Some of you lived through this, right? You may have, you may have seen him, heard him, seen these, uh, read his things in the Reader's Digest or Ladies Home Journal. So it was Fosdick's media presence that helped kind of, not just him, but he was a big player in it, that kind of helped spread these ideas in progressive circles. So um, it kind of helped it spread. So today, it's not surprising that prophetic, the adjective, means social justice in progressive places like liberation theology. It's all over Latin American liberation theology. Black liberation theology. The word gets used that way. And it gets, it's all over the, at least the progressive wings of certain denominations like your own. So the PCUSA, the UCC that I'm involved in, the um, Lutheran Church, the ELCA, Uh, Is there even the the liberal, more progressive wings of the United Methodist Church? You can go, when you see prophetic, that's what it means there. And partly it's the way that the social gospel, gospel got circulated. You can even find it, I mentioned this before, in movements that are hostile to religion and they don't know where they got it. Because it That's the way that common knowledge works. Now, you may have seen, why in the world is she telling me the history of old white guys? Right? Um, That people that don't have anything to do with you, you probably don't know anything about Fellhausen or any of these plays. You may never have heard of these people, and you might not think that they have anything to do with you. But... This is my point today. 
is that if you have ever heard the word prophetic used to mean social justice, or heard somebody like Martin Luther King called a prophet, or thought of prophets as primarily advocating for the poor, you have been influenced by them. I gotta tell you, maybe you're gathering this by that talk, I'm a feminist, I support racial justice, I do gender work, I do all of that, and it kind of bothers me that I'm influenced as much by these guys as I am. <laughs> but I am, and that's part of this really hard work that we have to do, that we have been traditioned into seeing particular things. Uh, again, you've, wherever you are, you have probably heard pastors who have read, who for their textbooks have used this kind of scholarship as the way they learn to be pastors. I, I know this because they're in the textbooks that I assign. So just because we don't know our history doesn't mean we haven't been influenced by it. Oh, don't you hate that? Now, we don't have to know all of that history, but it is, what I was trying to do is to make the point that what we see in a text or in other people is not just the plain text of the matter. It's what we've been taught to see as the plain text of the matter. So no wonder some things seem obvious and normal to me <laughs> because I've been taught to see them as obvious and normal and other people don't see them as obvious and normal because they weren't taught to see them as obvious and normal. So again, it's not just the way things are, it's a certain way of reading that we have to take responsibility for. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just doesn't mean that other people are stupid if they don't see it the same way. Or, you know, again, perhaps you can tell, I'm talking as much about myself as I am about anybody else. When we call people who don't agree with us uneducated, that is the great liberal put down of other people's views. Well, maybe they're not uneducated. Maybe they're differently educated. <sighs> Again, talk to myself. <clears throat> so that's, that's a really interesting question. I like to recognize my ideas come from somewhere. <laughs> they, they're, they're influenced by other people. So once you do that, just like with Titus Kafar, you have to know what you've been trained to see. Then you can say, okay, I get that. What else, what else is there? What, what am I not looking? So I thought I would try it with yet another biblical text for a few minutes. What would happen if we kind of applied the Titus Kafar method to a, this particular text? Behind there. Uh, it comes from Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 begins this way. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. Now chances are, if you hear that, you immediately think of Jesus. And the reason, if you do, that you would immediately think of Jesus is that we have been taught to hear that passage as being about Jesus. We're even taught that way by the New Testament. So that's what's actually in front of Isaiah 61 here. According to the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus started his ministry at his hometown synagogue, he stood up, read Isaiah 61, and so why wouldn't Christians think that Jesus was applying that to himself and that Isaiah 61 must have been predicting Jesus? Because look, Luke, Luke makes it look that way. We have hymns in church that do this. The lectionary, the revised common lectionary, you know, that tells you what to read 
each year. The Revised Common Lectionary always pairs Isaiah 61. It puts it right before Christmas so that we're even more encouraged to read it as about Jesus. Now, in both passages, both the Isaiah that's in the background and the uh, Luke that's in the foreground, it'd be really easy to focus on the social justice part. And that's true even if we would keep reading in Isaiah 61. Because look, I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing, right? Well, sure, isn't it just in the text that we, is all about social justice? Sure, those things are there. But what would happen, again, if we whited out the things that we've been taught to focus on and to see what else is there? This is the way Isaiah 61 ends, which is rarely included in the lectionary. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before the nations. Here's my provocative question today. What would happen if that became the foreground instead of the background, right? And what if we read that passage in light of what is going on on our planet? Um, I, I am so convicted about the environmental situation that I will no longer call it climate change. I call it the climate catastrophe. And I'll be honest with you, you you don't have to agree with me. I, I am looking really hard to find hope because things are scarily pushing to the edge of the point of no return. So you probably know all of this, but I'll give you a few pieces of things that have appalled me, that not only is plastic choking all of our waterways, I mean, we we kind of all know that. We're supposed to recycle them. We're supposed to use the dispose, I mean, the reusable water bottles. But again, I just heard last week on Science Friday (laughs) that the tiny particles, not just in your face scrub, but the particles that are wearing off of any polyester and everything that is plastic, those microplastics are now in every bite of food you eat, every amount of water that you drink, even the ones in the bottles, right? Even the ones in my glass container. They even have found them on the top of Mount Everest where they believe they came off from the performance clothes of climbers. Like everything about us is now throughout the world. Three quarters of all the earth's lakes and rivers have been used for crops or livestock cultivation. Three quarters of all land on the earth, three quarters of all the land on the earth has been made into farm fields are used for a dam or covered up with concrete. So perhaps you've heard about this. There's a a new book about it as well, that unlike the first five extinctions of the planet that took 500,000 years for those species to go extinct, we're now in the midst of a sixth extinction of animals around the world, all all of their habitats around the world. And it is caused completely by human control of planet. So for the first time, right, the, the geologic era that we're in now is not being caused, called by what the rocks are, but by us. It's called the Anthropocene, 
anthropos, human. And so I think about this text. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as the garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. That is a beautiful text. It inspires me, and that text takes the earth for granted. It takes the earth for granted, and friends, I don't think that that's a luxury that we've ever had, much less have any more. So what, what would it mean if we began to ask questions, not just about the way we use water bottles, but also about our religious traditions and ask, how do we need to think differently in order to address the very real problems of our world? I don't know if you know this, that there, there are Christian environmentalists who are saying the same thing, that, that we even have to think about the way we talk about creation and creation care. Because they say, you know, you're making it sound like you have a backyard garden to make pretty and to, to take care of. It's a really different thing when you begin to talk about how will we address the devastation that is in front of us. So back to my theme, what justice are we ignoring when we bring only our lenses about certain kinds of justice to a passage and to the world. It's not that these things have to compete with each other. They're all true. But there are things that we are missing because we are only looking at one thing at a time. So here's my appeal and my plea, right? That we have to stop ignoring what can no longer be ignored. And that's our planet, what's happening to our planet. It's other people who don't think like we do. And, and this is the work of the church as well as the world, the work of the world. And as much as I love the Bible, I've spent a career studying it, writing about it, and I'm going to keep doing that. But, but we're going to need to do more than just quote the Bible if we're going to get anything done. So we're going to have to quit using it like those speeches do where they, you know, they go to the Internet or to uh, a Bartlett's book of famous quotations. Sometimes I think we use the Bible that way. We go find a quote that will make what we're saying look really good. If we're going to engage the Bible and do this work, we're going to have to quit using it as a resource of quotes we're going to have to start really engaging it and engaging the world that we do. So, you know, to summarize it, these orthodoxies about prophets, about anything else, they're not serving us well. Because as long as we act like things are common knowledge and we can't go beyond them, then we're not going to get anywhere. So this world, the, the planet needs us to take responsibility for the traditions that we inherit, the ways that we see, and I really do believe that there is only going to be hope if we learn to see more. If we begin to see more, we begin to see the earth, we begin to see what we're doing it, and we begin to see other people. So it is time to proclaim good news to the poor and to uplift the oppressed and it's also a time to deal with all the forms of injustice in our world. And we believe that God is with us in that work. So that's what I think. I'm going to stop there and see what kind of questions or pushback that maybe you have um, about my suggestions, my appeal, my argument. Or you can just say something smart. <laughs> You're smart people. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, good. 
I like that one. And then I see somebody behind you, too. What is truth? Like pilots, great question. See, that's a question. Um, no, I mean, that is so important. And, and so I'll, I'll give you my own answer to that, which may not, may not be satisfying. But I do believe that it is essential that the church and we have to stake our faith and claim what we believe. We, uh, instead of just saying, oh, it's one view among others. However, we do that with a humility and I hate arrogance more than just about anything in the world so you're welcome to call me on it when you see it showing up in me. That, that, that the arrogance that we understand all of God's views in the world, I, I think we always need to come at everything with some level of humility but there are things Here's the way I would say it. To the degree that God has revealed them to me today, this is where I can stand, and I will do that work, and others stand with me. And I'm going to be open. If God needs me to hear something else, God will reveal that maybe through other people in that way. But, but to me, the biggest... truth in that is that what the things that are fundamental, love, love of God, love of neighbor, right? Uh, we are grounded in that, but what that looks like in any particular situation, we have to be open to seeing what that looks like. So, I mean, we, we've, we've learned that painfully as uh, white people, I've learned this fam famously as white people, when I think I'm doing good work, I'm still doing harm because I haven't listened to how my efforts are affecting people of color. So it's not just that I had good intentions, which is, is important, but I have to be able to listen to people who respond to my attempts to love God and neighbor. So I do think, I don't know if I'm, this is a satisfying answer, that the church has to affirm things that are fundamental to its belief and mission. And for me, that is love of God and neighbor. Um, but what that's going to look like, I think the church, you know, what we sometimes say, the church, our churches are reformed, but always reforming. We're, we're always learning more about what that looks like now. Um, and, and one other just little piece of this. The other thing, common knowledge, that fascinates me is that truth didn't used to mean 
scientifically verifiable truth. I think that is also a repercussion of the Enlightenment. That this idea that if you can't, if you can't point to it, then it's not real. But there, in my life, there are truths that are far more fundamental because they have to do with my relationships, they have to do with my experience of God and with hearing other people's experience of God. So I think there's another case of recognizing what do we mean, what are we looking for when we ask is something true? Are, are we asking that you could prove it with archaeology or that we could prove it? Because, you know, I have students that if you can't show them archaeologically that certain things happened in the Bible that say they happened in the Bible, then you can't trust anything the Bible says. Well, for me, there it, it sounds fudgy, but there there's different ways in which different truths are known. And science is really important to me. I think we've gone through a year where we see the repercussions of not paying attention to the science. Um, but yet, when it comes to matters of relationship, there are things in addition to science. Okay. Truth, what is truth? Yeah, 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 thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, there's one back here. It's really hard. I do think it's, it's a both and, and it's a really delicate balance to keep. On the one hand, you, you can tell by what I'm saying that even, even progressives, and I call, I call myself a liberal, I'm happy to call myself a liberal, a progressive, all those things, that I and, and people like me can be pretty arrogant about the way we do that. And we use the Bible just as selectively as folks that we call conservatives, and we're not listening to them either. And I'm really against that. So I've, I believe that on the one hand, one truth, is I have to be able to listen to these Trump prophets and not just call them stupid, uneducated, and terrible. I have to actually listen to what they're saying and then, but then I do, on the other hand, I do have to make some judgments about that based on convictions and reality. How to talk people out of alternative facts, I was hoping you would tell me. Um, because it's very difficult. And the, I do think we're even seeing this in the political realm, that the more we treat people who even who disagree about the science as stupid, the, the harder that it gets pushed on that, the more resistance people are going to push back at. So, I mean, for me, it's a real judgment call in the moment of when do you really push and when do you make sure that you've listened to the concerns and the fears. So I don't know if that's a matter of style, but you know, with the plateau of vaccinations now, you know, you're probably hearing the same stories I have that just shaming people for not getting vaccinated 
or just yelling at them or doing that, that is not working. Just on a practical standpoint, it is not working. So what they are finding is working is that you go to where people live, right? So you go to where people live, you talk to them, you, you do that. Now, that's not the same thing as the national political stage, which is so big it's hard to do that. And so maybe you'll think I'm being naive by saying listen to people. But I, I don't think we're getting anywhere by feeding the, pol feeding the polarization ourselves. Well, you can, were you going to ask something, Dr. Ramey? I, I was. Uh, the seminary professor, you kind of in on a, a word poll. Do you see that poll in the younger generation of incoming seminarians that are a little more receptive to um, Julius Safar's type of whitewash view of the speech editor? It's, it's a mixed bag. You know, because I do think, and every institution kind of gets a different kind of clientele. Not all of our students are the same. They're liberal to progressive. We have Unitarians and Charismatics and everybody in the middle. But I will say that it's, It's a mixed bag that, that there, there can be a level of despair when you realize what you've been missing. And I, I'm not sharing this with you, but in general, I get people who get more mad at their churches for not telling them a diverse point of views than they get mad at me as a seminarian, a professor. So like things about the Bible that they never knew before Sometimes they get mad at me, but often they're more mad at, why didn't anybody ever tell me this before? I taught undergraduates when I lived in North Carolina, and that, that happened regularly with 18-year-olds. They were more mad at their pastors for not showing them more than they were um, at others. So I do think people don't go to seminary unless they have some level of hope. Because it's, it's not an easy profession, but they do believe that people matter and that, that their lives can make a difference and that what they do makes a difference. I do think, I, I'm sad to say this, but we're getting more and more students who aren't sure that the church is the way that's going to heal the world, who are looking at chaplaincy, nonprofits, all of that. I mean, so hope, hope in God and hope in other people and hope in change, yes, but it, we work on this to, to say that the church is bigger maybe than the church you've experienced yourself and that the church has more resources than maybe you knew. But it, it has been harder. I've been at Lancaster Seminary 22 years, and it's, it's harder and harder to have people to have hope that the institution of the church is willing to address the problems of the world. So we work on that. I mean, I, I don't mean to make that sound terrible. I mean, we work on that. I mean, no way. And... Um, some of the other wonderful instructors that we have there, you know, they've been there to, to show what kind of resources does the church have to address poverty, to address issues like mass incarceration. And I do think maybe you could answer that, Noe, if you see students who, who leave with more hope because they, they find things they can do that will make a difference. But we've really tried to, to build into our curriculum not just Bible and theology, which are important, but also like the church and social change. Um, I learned about Titus Kafar because I teach a course in Christianity and the arts, and how does what role do the arts have in 
change. So um, I, I think to ask people to have hope, we have to keep working at have, giving them a reason to hope. Hi. You can fight with each other. Who goes first? We talk about this all the time. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot of people who are looking for, like, what is the magic answer that will bring young people to our church? And the, the truth is, is that, and, and again, I, I'm not speaking about Highland because I don't know your situation enough to be able to talk to you, so I'm talking in general. So please don't take what I'm getting ready to say personally. Right? If you want young people in your church, your church might have to change. Because, again, some of the churches that I go to, they're saying, we want young people in the church. And I ask them why. And they say, because we don't want to close. So the, we want young people to come and take up the mantle that we've been carrying. Because because people have been faithful in church for a long time. So I'm, I'm not dismissing all of that. But the, the question is, have you asked young people who aren't in church like what they're looking for? And so one of the things that, um, again, the internet and social media, for all of the negative things they can feed, go listen to what people care about. You know, so I think the question has to be bigger than why don't young people come to church? The question is, what are people's needs? What are people committed to? These climate change young people that I'm involved in, they're more passionate about some of the things that they care about, but they don't see the church doing that, so they're going other places. Um, again, I, I realize that there's differences in the room, but but issues of gender equality, it, it really matters to a lot of people and, if, and racial justice. And if churches are not taking public stances on that, there's going to be a lot of people who aren't going to... I mean, they're asking the question, why should I come to church? If I can get these... If I can find hope in other spaces. You know, I, I know that sounds harsh, but there's a, there's a way in which... You can't, I think you can't start with the question is how do I keep my institution running? But the question is like, what is our mission? What is our mission? So that's why at the seminary we try to, even for ourselves, because we're an institution that's threatened with all of the decline and the, all of that, we keep trying to ask ourselves, which is hard, instead of how do we keep the doors open? We ask ourselves, what is our mission? And what would that look like? And that's hard, because I don't want the doors to close. Right? But, but how do you keep your focus on why are we here? The, the why instead of the what. Good for you. I mean, I, I talked to several people today that you guys, many of you have been doing this work for a long time. It's not like the first time that anybody's ever said the word social justice to you. Like you've been doing the work, some of you a lot longer than I have. So I, I, don't, I don't mean to do that. And you can't do it forever, right? There's, there's ways in which our energy 
you know, all of that. So I guess the question is, instead of, instead of handing our mantle to somebody else, how do we go find out where it's happening already? And maybe those folks will be in this sanctuary, and maybe they won't, but it doesn't mean the work of God's not being done. You know, so. Julia, anyway. you're asking some big questions. I know, I know, I know. Uh, yes, 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 sorry. I was just thinking maybe I should do a lecture part two, but I'm sensing that no, no. Because I was going to team up here to talk about church and social change, but next time. Okay, well, well, let's, let's pray. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Brien. Thank you, God, for this wonderful time, for your thought-provoking statements and uh, sharing. And I thank you for Dr. Julia O'Brien's friendship and the way that she shares in a pastoral yet prophetic way, things that we need to hear in this congregation and also at home or wherever the online viewers are watching us. I pray for hope. We all wrestle with hope in these difficult times, but our life, in life and in death, we belong to you, and in you there is hope. And we pray that together, We'll keep finding ways to serve you and worship you, but also to join where people are in need, whether it's here in Lancaster or in Peru, wherever we are from. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.